And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator and our special guest speaker. Our moderator is James Arroyo, and he serves as director of the Ditchley Foundation, an organization based in England that addresses current challenges and aims to shape the future through connecting people and ideas. A very admirable uh, approach, I would say. And until the summer of 2016, James was the equivalent of Chief Data and Digital Officer for the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, charged with adapting foreign policy and national security to the digital age. In addition to his work at Ditchley, James is working on a data analytics startup company, and he advises other startups and established companies focused on cybersecurity and digital innovation. And he's recently written a book on technology and power entitled The Digital Prince, which is described as Machiavelli reimagined for the digital age. So welcome, James. And now let me introduce our very special guest speaker this afternoon. We are pleased to host Lord Jonathan Hill, chairman of the Ditchley Foundation and an authority on the EU economic outlook regarding Brexit. Nominated by the former British Prime Minister David Cameron, Lord Hill took office in November of 2014 as the EU Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union with the responsibility of financial regulation across Europe. And his flagship program was the development of the European Capital Markets Union to increase the flow of investment capital throughout the EU. Lord Hill resigned as commissioner in June of 2016 in the immediate aftermath of the UK referendum on the EU membership. So very interesting times, I'm sure, and we'll hear about it today. Before becoming the European Commissioner, Lord Hill was a member of the British Cabinet as leader of the House of Lords and also Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster from 2013 to 2014. So please welcome the Right Honourable Lord Jonathan Hill. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Donna, for inviting me. Thank you, Michael Tang, for uh, getting me across to Chicago and uh, introducing me to some of your friends and giving us the chance to talk a bit about what's going on in the United Kingdom and what is uh, also going on with the Ditchley Foundation. And I'm thrilled to be here because it gives me the chance to escape, even if only for a day, from the depressing state of British politics and our general election campaign. So at the moment, there is nothing more guaranteed to cheer Brits up about politics at home than coming to the United States. <laughs> so um, thank you, all of you, for helping James and me feel a bit better about ourselves. Now, in 1944, just before the D-Day landings, in one of the many rows that the French President Charles de Gaulle had with Winston Churchill, de Gaulle demanded that Churchill should side with him against the United States. And Churchill, provoked beyond endurance, as people often were by de Gaulle, replied, you must know that when we have to choose between Europe and the open seas, we shall always be with the open seas. And de Gaulle never forgot that reply. It was still in his mind 20 years later when he vetoed Britain's application to join the European common market. And that theme, the choice for Britain between Europe and the open seas, between Europe and the US, is what I want to talk about today. And in doing that, I'm going to try and explain what is happening in the UK, what's happening in Europe, and what this might mean for the relationship between the US and the UK, and the US and the EU. Now these days, when I travel around the world, the first question I usually get asked is, what's gone wrong in the UK? What on earth has happened to those passionless, predictable, pragmatic Brits? 
And in Asia recently, the question came in a slightly different form. Boris Johnson, he looks just like Donald Trump. Are they the same? And I think that if you get your information about what's going on in Britain, just from the European and the international press, you might well imagine that our economy is about to collapse, that brother is divided from brother, old from young, north from south. So let me just start for a moment by challenging that picture. In fact, I want to make the counter-argument that despite everything that's been going on in the UK, British politics has in fact proved to be very resilient. Subjected to the most extraordinary pressures over the last three years, it's been tested to destruction by a lack of leadership and the lack of a majority in Parliament. Our two-party system has survived to a quite remarkable degree. Right up until the election was called, the overwhelming majority of MPs kept voting on party lines time after time. For more than three years, every day, come wind or shine, supporters of Leave and Remain have gathered outside Parliament, waving flags and placards, cheering and booing. Uh, you may have seen some of those pictures on the television. But in all that time, no matter how high emotions have been running, public order has not broken down. And the other day, I got a text from a French politician saying that they were very worried about violence breaking out on the streets of London. To which I said, no, don't worry, this is not France. <laughs> and uh, I was recently reading about the 1910 general election, all the way back then, and I was struck by some of the descriptions. Fire bombings carried out by the suffragettes. Churchill's children had to have police protection for fear of kidnap. Churchill himself was attacked at a public meeting with a dog whip. And you don't have to be that old to remember the chaos of the 1970s in the UK, the miners' strike in the 1980s, when there was certainly a lot more violence. So my first point is that the news of the death of British parliamentary democracy has, in my view, been greatly exaggerated. And indeed, you can equally well argue that the recent stalemate we've had in our Parliament has showed that the House of Commons was working. When the executive ceased to function, individual MPs stepped forward, as they're supposed to do, to try to fill the vacuum. So if that's Parliament, what's going on in the country at large? And I would describe the overwhelming feeling in Britain about Brexit, not as one of rage, but as one of boredom. And that, of course, is a much more typical British reaction. People are fed up with talking about it. It's, of course, precisely that mood which Boris Johnson is trying to tap into with his campaign slogan of Get Brexit Done. So what about the talk that you may have seen about the emergence of some new centre party grouping in the UK? You might have read about a new party called Change UK, and it is true that some Conservative and Labour MPs have joined the Liberal Democrats or become independents. Well, Change UK lasted about a week before it started splintering into warring subgroups. And so far, one of the themes of our general election has been that far from increasing, support for the Lib Dems, our, our third party, who should theoretically be well-placed to benefit from people switching away from the extremes, support for the Lib Dems has actually been squeezed between growing support for the two main parties. So my best guess is that if the Conservative Party wins the election, with a working majority, the British Parliament will settle down pretty quickly. And it's only if the election delivers another unclear result, another hung parliament, that a more fundamental realignment in British politics would become more likely. So if my first point is that the UK is more resilient 
than we might look from the outside. It's nevertheless true that in the three and a half years now since our referendum in June 2016, we have certainly got ourselves into a political mess. So how did that happen? And I'd say that there were three main reasons. There was a lack of honesty, a lack of leadership, and a lack of numbers. On honesty, it was always clear that we could not leave the EU having spent 40 years consciously integrating ourselves into it without there being disruption and some economic and political pain. When you make changes in politics, there are always winners and losers. And this was the biggest set of changes we'd made in nearly half a century. So, of course, there were always going to be plenty of both. Nor were our politicians ever honest about the fact that we faced some fundamental choices. What was more important, maintaining frictionless trade with the EU or having more control over our own laws and borders? Did we want to remain close to the EU in terms of regulation and values or diverge from them? Instead of trying to answer those questions, we've spent now over three years claiming that we can keep all the things that we like while getting rid of all the things that we don't like. And meanwhile, the EU side was very clear. Either you are a member with the advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages that a membership brings, or you're a third country with all the disadvantages and advantages that that brings. The second big problem I'm afraid that we've had was uh, lack of leadership. Uh, Theresa May was someone who found it difficult to take decisions and to inject pace into the negotiations. And you all know from business that when you're faced with a difficult situation, taking a decision, any decision, and providing direction can often be more important than the detail of the decision itself. And normally in Britain, if you've got a prime minister who's struggling, our two-party system auto-corrects itself and the leader of the opposition then forces the Prime Minister out of office. And it's been our bad luck as a country that at this, this crucial time we had Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. Because just when you thought that things couldn't get any worse under Theresa May, up would pop Jeremy Corbyn. And for three whole years, instead of hounding her out of office, which I believe any previous Labour leader would have succeeded in doing, he looked so unelectable that he actually managed to cement her in the job. Then the third big factor in creating this paralysis was the numbers, the arithmetic in Parliament. Even with this lack of leadership and lack of honesty I've talked about, a Prime Minister with a working majority would have got a deal through Parliament. Numbers in politics, like in business, really matter. But from the point that Mrs May lost her majority in the, 19, uh, in the 2017 general election, it was clear that she was going to struggle to get a deal through unless she chose to try to build support across parties. There were propositions for which that might have been possible, but instead, she ploughed ahead, and rather than building bridges to consensus, she blew them up. So she then survived as Prime Minister for two more years after that election, but the price that Britain has paid has been political paralysis. And during that time, opinion in Westminster radicalised rather than moderated. The opportunity for compromise evaporated, and we've ended up in the deadlock that eventually triggered the general election. So while Britain's political classes were busy staring at their collective navel and failing to agree on how we could leave the EU, what's been going on in Europe? Well, quite a lot, actually. And far from sitting there hoping that the UK is going to rejoin, it's been getting on with the job of reinventing itself, partly because of Brexit, but also because of broader global political developments. Before Britain voted to leave the EU, 
there was a strange balancing act, like um, a three-legged stool between Germany, the UK, and France. And far from having no influence in the UK, in the EU, the UK actually had rather a lot of influence, and we were an effective break on further integration. And that was something that often suited Germany rather well. But with Brexit, that strange balance has been disturbed. France and Germany have been driven closer together, which rather than making things easier, as you might imagine, has left the Germans feeling a bit more exposed and a bit more vulnerable to pressure for further integration. And because of Mrs. Merkel's political difficulties in Germany, it's now President Macron of France who's calling more of the shots in European politics. So put at its most simple, without Britain as a member, the EU is becoming more French. At the same time, President Trump's strategy of seeking to uh, div divide the world into camps, his trade wars, his dislike of multilateralism and what one might call the rules-based liberal order, has provoked a corresponding response from the EU side. So Brexit plus Trump has led to greater European self-definition and people are choosing sides. And that's why I think we've already seen moves towards greater European defence cooperation, more talk of a European industrial policy, more screening of foreign investment into the EU in areas like defence and tech, policies to try to reduce unfair competition from uh, the big US tech companies, more talk of using trade policy as a tool to export European values. And with a new European Commission about to take office for the next five years, um, in a couple of days' time, we should assume that this trend will uh, continue and accelerate, particularly if President Trump wins a second term and if Britain, after a general election won by Boris Johnson, chooses to diverge from European rules and approaches to regulation. So, uh, coming back to today, what is likely to happen in Britain's general election just over two weeks away on December the 12th? In the red corner, we've got Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, who is the most unpopular leader of the opposition since polling records began. <laughs> uh, in the blue corner, we've got Boris Johnson, who is the most unpopular new Prime Minister since polling records began. <laughs> So in some ways, this is an election about least bad options. And uh, some of that may sound familiar to some of you. <laughs> the Labour Party is proposing an extremely radical extension of state power and an enormous increase in public spending. Whether that takes you back to Britain in the 1970s or Russia in 1917, it's certainly a very long way from the Labour Party of the last 30 years to which we've all become accustomed. And by their normally more fiscally responsible standards, the Conservatives are also proposing spending increases and have been moving some way from the conservatism of Margaret Thatcher. But at the heart of the election is going to be Brexit. And here, I believe, the Conservatives have the advantage of a much clearer proposition which seems to me to be nearer to the public mood. The choice, or at least the choice as framed by the Conservatives, is that Boris Johnson will get Brexit done, whereas with Labour, you'll have another delay, another renegotiation, and two more referendums, one on the EU, another on Scotland, with a dose of Marxism thrown in for good measure. Now, as things stand, there are only two possible outcomes. There are conservative victory or another hung parliament where no one party wins a majority, but where the Labour Party is likely to be the second biggest party, the Scottish Nationalists and the Liberal Democrats come to some kind of arrangement. Of the two at the moment, if you go on the national opinion polls, the more likely result seems to be a conservative victory, 
their lead in the opinion polls has been pretty stable now throughout the campaign for three weeks at between 10 to 12 points. If anything, it's slightly nudging up. So I just want to say something now, look forward to what might happen after December the 12th. Because depending on the result, I see two very distinct paths. One that takes the UK further away from the EU and closer to the US, and one that keeps us closer to the EU and further away from the US. If the Conservatives do win, the first thing that will happen, Boris Johnson will pass his withdrawal agreement he negotiated with the EU. I think that will pass very swiftly. Uh, it will be done early in the new year. But even if that is correct, that does not mean that Brexit is all done and dusted. Because what the withdrawal agreement sets out is the terms on which the UK will leave the EU. The question of our future relationship with the EU, which is the much more important and difficult issue about our trading relationship with the EU, that still lies ahead. Personally, I believe that the logic of Brexit, reinforced by commitments that have been made by the Prime Minister and his colleagues during the election campaign, will take us down the route of diverging from the EU. And I say that as someone who, during the referendum, campaigned for Remain. But I think that it would make no sense whatsoever for Britain to tie itself to a system over which, as a third country, we would no longer have any influence whatsoever. And given my belief that without the UK as a member, the EU is likely to develop in directions with which the UK has never been comfortable, I think that that would be a miserable and unsustainable place for Britain to end up. But if we do start trying to diverge, we shouldn't imagine for one moment that the EU will take that lying down. And on the contrary, they've been very clear that if the uh, UK wants to have a meaningful free trade agreement with them, they will expect us to sign up to all sorts of level playing field commitments on things like the environment, on labour laws, to stop us undercutting them. They do not want, the French in particular don't want, but not just the French, to have a powerful economy on their doorstep with easy access into their markets, being able to outcompete them. And from their point of view, you can understand why. So this crunch, this point of decision as to whether the UK stays close to European markets but without control or further from European markets but with more control is the decision that in essence the UK has been delaying now for three and a half years. The closer we stay to the EU, the less scope there'll be for free trade agreements with other countries like the US, the less opportunity there'll be for the UK to construct its own regulatory regime to compete in areas like financial services where we are a world leader. But the further away we move, the greater the disruption to businesses, particularly in manufacturing, with supply chains which depend on easy access to the European single market. So there is no pain-free decision. But once that withdrawal agreement is passed, it's a decision that we're not going to be able to postpone any longer. So this, I think, is going to be the political story of 2020, and it's going to come to a head pretty quickly in the new year. It's also, of course, linked inextricably to the question of the UK's future trading relationship with the US. The more that Mr Johnson seems to be tacking towards Mr Trump, whatever quick and dirty greatest deal ever he dangles in front of us, the more the EU is going to squeeze us from the other direction. And so no matter where the economics or security interests might point, the politics, I think, are all going in one direction. If Boris Johnson doesn't win, then the path forward looks very different. While I don't believe that uh, Jeremy Corbyn can win an outright majority, another hung parliament would mean that we'd face prolonged uncertainty as we headed towards a second referendum. It would also be clear that we would end 
aligning ourselves much more closely with the European system, not least because of the deep anti-Americanism, which is such a feature of Mr. Corbyn's thinking. So I'm going to uh, stick my neck out and end with some predictions, where I hope you will be generous and only remember the ones that I get right. <laughs> Boris Johnson will win the general election. Britain will leave the EU. The EU will integrate further and become more protectionist. Over this coming year, the UK will be forced to choose between the EU and the US. And under Boris Johnson, we will end up choosing the open seas. Now, over the last 40 years, the UK has done a brilliant juggling act, managing to maintain a relationship with both the US and the EU as a bridge between the two to the advantage of both. My view is that one day we were going to have to make a choice of this kind in any case. But Brexit and Mr. Trump have brought the date of that choice forward. And next year is the year that the UK is going to have to choose. Thank you. You're going to interrogate me, James. Uh, I'm not going to interrogate Jonathan because he's actually my boss. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just reflecting as I sat up here, this is probably the closest, being Englishman, this is probably the closest we've ever sat with each other. It, no, it, it, it is a little uncomfortably so close. It, yeah. So if we look awkward, then, then that, that's what it's about. Um, <coughs> Jonathan, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to start by asking you a question about the past and, and how things were in the past. Uh, you quoted uh, Churchill, and Churchill is obviously closely associated with Ditchley Park. Uh, for those who don't know, it's where uh, Churchill received Harry Hopkins on his visit during the war and where the early details of Lend-Lease were worked out. And Churchill ran the war from there in the early years during the weekends, starting this kind of like vein of uh, transatlantic cooperation. But the point I want to pick up from that is, you know, at Ditchley, our core belief is that you shape the world by connecting people the right people, the right mix of people, but by connecting people. Uh, you've been in politics a long time, starting out with John Major, and I think I always find it incredibly interesting when you talk about how the practice of politics has changed in terms of how people work together and the time they, they make to really connect. I mean, could you just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is relevant to some of the challenges we yeah. face now. I do. So... Uh I think, in, in essence, I mean, this is not a, um, a kind of startling insight, but the, the speed of politics has accelerated massively from when I started in the mid-1980s. And some of that is technological, and some of that is practice and behavior. So, to take an extreme example, when I started, uh, I had a shorthand typist. Didn't have a mobile phone the internet hadn't been developed. Uh, or perhaps some clever person was developing it, but we weren't using it. Um, and so what that meant was firstly that the process of government, the process of politics, it, it was more structured and ordered. So before I had to uh, put in a, a note to my Secretary of State or the Prime Minister, I, I had to think through what I wanted to say before I committed it to paper through my shorthand typist. And so what we have nowadays, much more, I think, everyone, everything is an unfinished conversation. It doesn't really have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I've seen when I went back into government 30 years later, mm. government was being carried out by text. Uh, so um, everything was... Uh, much faster, much smaller, that there's been much more centralization in the way that government mm. is carried out in the UK. And this notion has taken root, I mean, I would date it to 1997 was the big change when Mr. Blair came in, um, that you've got to get ahead of the media the whole time on every story. 
And the speed of response or announcement is much more important than the substance. So I, I remember saying to one of the clever, bright young men, and they were all young men at number 10 under Mr. Cameron, you know, don't you think it would be a good idea to slow down a little bit. You, you don't have to rush out a statement immediately. Don't you think it would be sensible to think what you're trying to achieve and let's work out our strategy? And you know, he said to me, well, you don't understand how anything works anymore and this is how it has to be. And um, I, I do understand how it works. I mean, what it has led to is a diminution in the quality of decision making, uh, hysterical media coverage, that is impossible really for anyone to take seriously. Mm. If you look at our election at the moment, one of the things that strikes me compared with the 92 election where I ran John Major's election was that now politicians can say things that I, I would co have considered 25 years ago were huge stories in a developing campaign, either a mistake or an announcement, and they just drop like a pebble without a splash into the water. They've gone in a couple of hours. The Labour Party announced a 32-hour week, and then they said it would cover the whole, whole economy, and then they said it wouldn't cover the health service, and then they said it would cover the health service. So in, in old money, this would have been a massive moment in an election campaign that you would plough in and you would mm. use to accentuate your political story. It had gone, it had gone within two hours. And so I think this this problem of, of uh, I, I think the public discern that our politics has become infantilized and is not serious. Whatever form that takes in our countries, it has different manifestations. And you have a manifestation, we have a manifestation. The public know this is not right. And it's eroding trust in the political system, I think. And I think the other thing, to your question about relationships and connections, which is what we try and do at Ditchley, I've seen, certainly between Britain and the EU, the quality, the number and quality and depth of our relationships between British politicians and European politicians has been reducing probably over a seven to ten year period. In the last mm. three and a half years, it has shriveled almost to zero. No, I'm exaggerating, but very few European politicians any longer come to Britain. European commissioners, which I used to be one, they used to come to London the whole time. I mean, we're getting two or three a year. Mm. So this means that people don't know how to pick the phone up to each other. They don't understand each other. They don't know what they're thinking. The European side is forming their view of what's happening in Britain from what they read in the Financial Times, The Guardian, and on the BBC website, which excellent publications though they are, mm. do not present a rounded picture of what's happening in Britain. So I think this point that I know you uh, are, are very focused on with Ditchley mm. as being a place where we can, where Britain, for instance, can try and rebuild relationships with the EU, but also with our friends in the US, I think is vital to how we get our politics working better again. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a sense even with American politicians that they know uh, the UK less well than they would have done decades previously for all of the improvements of communications and vice versa, by the way, absolutely vice versa. Is there any way back on that? Yeah, I mean, there's always a way back. I mean, I, I, I think the, the way back is um, to have a politics where you are more honest about your choices, where you think more about strategy, less about tactics, where you work hard um, to, uh, you know, from, from a diplomatic point of view, on these relationships, where you um, try uh, to um, stop yourself getting sucked into this downward spiral of trivialization. And it's quite hard, and a lot of people say, would say to me that I'm completely mm. out of touch and this is a pipe dream. But I, I, I don't believe it is impossible to change the way you do things. It was done, politics were conducted much more like this 25 years ago. There were a series of changes that we made in Britain as to how we did our politics there, which you could unmake. Mm. Uh, yes, the technological change is obviously a big factor, but I don't think it's the case 
that every time someone asks you for an instant comment, that you have to provide it. I mean, if you all did that with your businesses the whole time, you would find yourselves completely in a mess because you'd be responding before you found out the facts. Uh, and this is exactly what's happening in politics. Instant replies, then someone digs in and checks and they find out what they said is not true. Then, do you do a U-turn? Do you, what do you do? And so, more time, um, less, you know, less haste, more speed. Uh, okay, before we open up to questions, let me just ask you a little bit about the, the future. One of our discussions that had a, a deep impression on me was when we held that discussion on the future of global finance that you co-chaired with Larry Summers uh, in April. Yeah. And we, we looked at the, uh, the prospects for, for, the U, for the UK and for the US, for specifically for, for London uh, and Wall Street, um, as technology, Brexit, and particularly China started to have a real impact. And Larry Summers painted, as he does, this kind of brilliant uh, context for this of secular stagnation, economic uh, pedal pressed to the floor, but the growth not resulting. It's okay, but it's not what you would expect. So we're, we're still living in abnormal times. Um, what worries me is our inability to plan for the future uh, in a really thoughtful way as China is trying to do just that. Um, how do you see that? I mean, how do you see our response to China? What does that mean, do you think, for finance? And what are the, what's the vision for the future that can stand up to that? Yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing is that, uh, in terms of finance, Britain has got to, to make one of these choices I was referring to about uh, which where does it see its future and which regulatory um, regime does it want to be part of? Uh, what I think I argued uh, at that conference you were referring to with Larry was that, you know, if you look from a British point of view, first of all, financial services is one area where we clearly are world leaders along with the United States. Mm. And when you look at the impact of technological disruption on the financial service sector, uh, do I think, in essence, that the UK, as a unitary state, if it gets its act together, would be better at responding to technological change in financial services from a regulatory point of view than the EU? Yes, 100% I do. Mm. I think the EU will be... It, it, it has a very slow legislative system. It has to, because it's a consensus-building yeah. mechanism. But... Um, you know, the point at which I left Brussels, um, so eight years, no, yeah, eight, nine years after the financial crisis, legislation they put in place to respond to the financial crisis still had not been enacted, some of it. So that is not a recipe that I would want for dealing with fast-moving technological change in mm. financial services. So uh, if you take that as an example, and, and this was one of the themes of, of Mill Reef, UK, US, London, New York, and elsewhere working together on global financial service standards and regulatory alignment, I think makes a lot of sense, but that means that some existing models of um, uh, financial service business in the UK are going to be affected. But I, I do think fundamentally in terms of global, a global uh, place for capital markets activity, I don't really see how that's ever going to be China. I do think it's the question is whether we want it only to be New York mm. or whether we're happy for it to be New York and the UK. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's an example of where you have to go for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well let's open up to, to questions then, John. Uh, a microphone? We're going to start small segment with these questions. Could you talk a little bit more about what happens to financial services in London? If we see this New York London axis, what, what will the jobs grow? What will change? So the, the, the question was if, um, uh, with what's going on in financial services in London, um, if the UK does manage to uh, construct a new regulatory f regime, what will, what will change? And 
there I, I so I'm, I'm quite bullish about the future prospects of uh, London as a financial centre. I mean, the thing I'm frustrated by is that we've spent three and a half years not coming up with an alternative future. And my fear has been that, you know, when you just sit somewhere and don't take a decision, that people come and start salami slicing bits of business away. And, and that, is, um, that is the downside risk for the UK. So I, I, I just think it's better that you don't sit there, you construct an alternative future, you work with our friends in the US. You know, we're both influential in global standard setting bodies and we should do that. So I don't take the view that you get when it's simplified in the UK that the UK is going to become a kind of deregulatory standards slashing. Singapore on Thames is the phrase that they use, which is probably a bit rude to Singapore. Um, <laughs> but because uh, if you want to be a global capital market player, you, you, you've got to be consistent with global standards or else you're going to have a fragmented market nowhere. So I would say, Britain, you've got to get on the front foot. We are respected in those bodies still. We could work with a number of countries on that agenda, particularly when you look forward to this technological change that's going to come. And you go for that. Uh, so far, there have been some moves of bits of the financial service sector away from London, but it hasn't gone to one place in Europe. It is frank, it's little bits have gone to Dublin, Luxembourg, bits to Paris, some to Brussels, banking bits to Frankfurt. But they have not, th there is not one obvious place in Europe who can supplant London. And the work I was trying to do on the Capital Markets Union, which was trying to build up Europe's capacity for having its own capital markets, uh, this is incomplete, to put it politely. Uh, so I, I think there is still an opportunity for London there. I don't believe that France uh, or Germany, to take the two obvious examples, are going to supplant London in the in the affections of global investors anytime soon. Mm. Got a question there? John? Please, please stand up so we can he hear you. Yeah. So would you mind repeating? Yeah, so, so the question, which is... Wh yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know that one can. So the question was, isn't it true that the case that people would make in Scotland for Scottish independence is pretty much the same case that Brexiteers would make uh, in Britain for leaving the EU single market, I think was the question. Um, I think it's precisely the same issue. Uh, it was a discussion we were having over breakfast this morning. I, I, I think the... Um, that, that the, it, it's quite, so the trade-off between having more of a border into your biggest single market and being uh, honest about having to accept some economic disruption from that, but you think that's a price worth paying because you've got more control over your, you know, uh, 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 country. Um, that's precisely the case that the, um, the, the, the advocates for Scottish independence make and will make. So um, I agree with your analogy. How do you prevent that happening? Um, I think the chance, the chance of there being a second referendum on Scottish independence uh, has, I think, increased as a result of the Brexit vote. The nature, and particularly if, as I believe it will, although it's not yet clear, Britain goes down the route of diverging from the EU, I think that increases those pressures in Scotland. I think there are domestic political factors in Scotland to do with the leadership of the Scottish National Party. There's a court case just starting against its previous leader, which I think is going to be messy, and that happens next year, 
There are elections in Scotland uh, for the Scottish Parliament in 2021. But I think after those elections, the, 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 or during them, the Scottish nationalists will campaign precisely on the grounds that you say, and the economic, rational economic arguments that the unionists like me would make will to some extent have been undermined by precisely that same experience going on south of the border. Is there anyone Boris can bring in to help with this on Scotland? In Josh? The cabinet? Mm. Mm. Uh, in what way? Well, because he's not going to be a, a great vote winner as a very English prime minister. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so how, how that will play out, um, I don't know. I mean, I think in part it depends on whether, you know, there are always unexpected things happening in politics to do with personalities that change. Mm. So in the same way as I was trying to argue earlier, that the odd coincidence of Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, which y you would not have predicted before it happening, either of them, I mean, both got there by accident, had a huge effect on a structural political development. Mm. So what might happen in Scotland, uh, I don't know. Um, the question of how, you know, who is going to front the unionist argument, the mm. pro-unionist argument in Scotland is obviously important. It's clearly not going to be an Englishman. I mean, it's going to be a Scottish person. Last time it was Ruth Davidson, yeah. uh, who did a very good job, who was the leader of then of the Scottish Conservative Party. Ruth's no longer, um, you know, actively involved in politics. So it will be a Scottish person that makes that case, not uh, an Englishman. Yeah. Okay, another question right here, Mohan. First, thank you for a really interesting overview, a first-hand overview on Brexit. Appreciate that. Uh, as you mentioned, if you break up with the European Union, you need a deal with the United States on trade. What is the likelihood of obtaining that, uh, given that our, our president is, seems to be rather better at tearing up deals uh, rather than putting them together? So, I mean, I think there's a, you know, there's a sort of technical process answer and then there's a human um, personality dimension. I mean, the technical process answer I is that conducting free trade agreements um, normally take longer than the time that the British have allocated to conclude our negotiations with the EU. That normally <coughs> other countries who want to do free trade agreements bilaterally with Britain would want to see what had happened to the EU agreement because you know you want to know what what the trade-offs are um, so and normally I think although I'm, I'm not a trade expert uh, if you're a big country dealing with a small country you can work out what normally happens in one of those negotiations so I mean that's the sort of technical side as to whether uh, you know what what might be the scale and the scope of such a deal. Against that, um, I would say that if, if you go back to this question of people being forced to make choices, I do think that politically, so notwithstanding Mr. Trump's overall position on some of these uh, free trade deals, um, his interests in wanting to do something with the UK at an emotional level and also, you know, in some sectors, I, I think make some sense. And if you're trying to put people into different camps and if you see that Europe is being, uh, is pushing back against Britain, I can see a sequence whereby, from his point of view, uh, doing a deal with the Brits makes some sense. So I, I, I don't... It, Given the track record on ripping things up, does it mean there won't be anything with the Brits? No, I don't think that. I think the question of what's included, what's the scope, who's in the driving seat, and then subsequently in the US with your politics, the question of what gets ratified, you know, those are all good, um, those are all good questions to which there is no very clear uh, short-term answer at the moment. Or perhaps there is a clear short-term answer, <laughs> but you know. So, so but but that that militates against it. So I'm going to throw one question here before we get one more. Um, can you give us some insights on the impact in Ireland 
with regards to border and customs issues? Yeah, so the people who've been most anxious about this whole process, because it's obviously the economy that is most affected, is the Irish. And one of the, one of the ironies of the negotiations, so I'm, so what, what tends to happen in Britain is that a certain group of people criticize everything that the British government has done, of which I have been guilty to some extent. Uh, but then they say that everything the European side does is brilliant. The Europeans are so clever. Uh, I don't share that view. So I think if you look at this from a strategic point of view, I'd make two points. First of all, I'm not aware, well, I certainly had no discussion before I left on the European side where there was any reflection at all as to whether they had contributed in any way to Britain leaving the EU. Zip. And I think that's quite an interesting <coughs> point about how they <laughs> think about the world and have not learnt the lessons of some of this. In the same way, I think more generally in our politics, I think in the US, and uh, it's true of certainly of a group of people in the UK, that they find it very difficult to admit that they might have contributed to some of the polarization that has taken place in British or American politics. That, so th the amount of reflection as to whether the people who were basically running you know, Europe, the West, the US for quite a long time as to the part they played has not been very advanced and their basic response has been to say everyone else is stupid and if only they weren't so stupid and I was still in charge, everything would be fine again. And I, I think that's a real problem and lies at the heart of this continuing political difficulty we have in all our countries. Um, so they've got, they got very close to the point where the whole objective of the European negotiation was to force Britain to remain in the customs union and therefore protect the interests of Ireland. But actually, they got perilously close to the whole thing collapsing precisely because of the question of the Irish border. So the thing that they set out to avoid actually became the thing that they have embedded. Um, where we've now got to on the border and with the Irish, so I'm, I'm off to Dublin tomorrow to talk to the Irish financial services sector, uh, which is massively impacted by what happens to London. Um, we've got to a point where the British government has ended up doing something on the Irish border that it said it wouldn't do, and where I think everyone is hoping that in practice, I mean, they hope, first of all, we can get to a free trade agreement that will mitigate some of the dangers, um, but that you can have a border where there are both checks and not checks, because we've been, we have not been speaking <coughs> with a unified voice as to whether there are going to have to be checks, mm. physical checks, or whether there are not going to have to be checks. And I think there is quite a lot has been left to trust and hope that we will somehow manage to resolve this difficulty. So is there, a, is there currently a clear legal economic solution that you can point to and say this is definitely going to work, uh, I'm not sure that there is. Mm -hmm. One final question. There's a mic right there. I'm from a little further north in the UK than you, but uh, the great man Winston Churchill also said, Americans invariably make, uh, arrive at the right answer after they've, they've explored all the alternatives. <laughs> to what extent do you think that that could apply to the decision of the people of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union and the howling protests that we've had from the political class and the liberal media in the UK ever since? Yeah, so um, I think, uh, as I argued, that um, we are going to leave. And I think the consequence of leaving, uh, 
which I, as, a, as someone who voted Remain, accept 100%. Uh, that that was, you know, we, we basically said to the British people, we're going to ask you to take this really important decision. Whatever you decide, we're going to act on. So please be very, very careful in how you make your decision. Fair enough. They took a decision. The way it works in our system, like yours, first past the post, one vote is enough. And I know it's the case that on the Remain side, before the result was in, they were saying, if we win by one, that's fine. It's over. So I think that same logic holds to them, who are now trying to pretend that um, <laughs> it was never clear and that they won't accept the result. But I think if and when uh, Boris gets his withdrawal agreement through Parliament, the politics in Britain is going to shift quite a lot because that question, the question of remain, has, you know, will cease to exist. It will be a question which is, do you want to join? Now, I personally think that if you had to stand up today in Britain or in many countries in Europe and run a campaign to join the EU, you're going to be struggling. Because a perfectly rational response from people might be to say, well, either mm -hmm, not sure what's going on at the moment, but you'd probably certainly say, well, I think I'd like to wait and see. So I think it will, I think it will change things quite a lot. Depending on what happens in the election, if, if the current trends continue, the fact that the Liberal Democrats, who are the party most closely associated with just ripping everything up and revoking Article 50, the fact that they do not look as though they're going to get any upswing from that at all, uh, I think that will have an effect on the politics. The Labour Party will obviously go through a period of introspection because they'll have to find a new leader. So I, I think the... the the sort of the dynamic will shift and I think that this mood that there has been of some people still trying to hold out and reject the result, I think they're going to find themselves increasingly um, in a minority. I, but I think to your, the Churchill quote about the Americans, they finally get there in the long term. Um, I think for Britain still at some point the question of are we one day going to end up in a closer relationship with the EU than we are going to have over the next 10, 15 years? I think that question is still going to be out there. I mean, my, my, my argument has been, in order for us to have a grown-up relationship with Europe in the long run, we're actually going to have to leave, probably leave quite a long way, work through whatever is going to happen, and then, in a more, from a more mature point of view, be able to establish a new relationship with Europe. Because the fact of where we are with our shared history, um, it seems daft that we don't have a close relationship. But I think we're going to have to have a more distant relationship before we one day end up having a closer one again. On that note, thank you so much for your wonderful insights. Thank you. For our help. Thank you.